It's time for another, another bit. Ease, what a way to start the week. We got a political sociologist. You say it three times fast. <laughs> The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, it's a professional liability not to be able to put your tongue in the right place. Nice to have you. Great to have you aboard. It's a beautiful, I, maybe it was the sunshine today. We actually have some. I didn't know that we had any in this region and we may not have any for another 10 days. So I hope you were able to soak it up. Uh, Michael Kennedy is one of my favorites. He is a political sociologist. He teaches at Brown University. He's a real thinker. And I haven't touched base with him at all, all through the latest, you know, saga of Mueller report findings and Barr and where we're going from here. And Michael Cohen went to jail today and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So we, we got a lot going on here. So let's get to it. In the meantime, I just want to mention there's a local story that's kind of interesting. It's there's going to be an ethics panel jump ball here, I think. The state Republican Party has once again reared its head and filed a complaint against State Senator Valerie Lawson. She is a paid executive with the National Education Association of Rhode Island, meaning the teacher union, and she's a senator. And she voted for, advocated for, the longtime contract bill. Some call it evergreen. Uh, the mayors all called it lifetime employment. What it does is it takes public employee contracts and when they expire, if no renewal, all the terms remain the same until a new one supplants it. Uh, Lawson herself was, I'm sure in her mind, a victim in East Providence because that's where she hails from and she used to run the teacher union there. Uh, you know, many years ago, a half a dozen years ago, maybe eight years ago, they cut the teacher's pay in times of crisis. You know, I mean, close to 10 years ago, now that I recall. Uh, and they called that foul. Well, they had no money in East Providence at the time, and they were trying to keep everybody employed. And I don't want to go through the play-by-play, -play, but clearly that tremor, that, that problem that that particular union had to deal with advised the continuing effort by the National Education Association to convince the state legislature to put this bill in, which is pending for signature by the governor. Now, the mayors and the leagues of city and town, or the league of cities and towns, is trying to still convince the governor not to sign it. Long story short, she voting on this in some ways could be characterized as a conflict of interest because she is voting on her own professional interest. However, the Ethics Commission has allowed for what's called a classification exemption, which is like if a firefighter is a state rep and it's a big, big bill on firefighters but doesn't necessarily relate specifically to that firefighter or that particular union that he works for, the vote is allowed. The Republican Party and its former GOP chairman is suggesting that because she has a higher level position with the NEA that she specifically benefited from it. So it's going to be an interesting ethics panel discussion. But know this, the NEA is moving very hard on elected bodies. We have a complete walking, talking ethics problem in South Kingstown with board member there. Um, ever since a recent Supreme Court decision on whether people are mandated to pay their union dues, they have been on a full court press to elect NEA members and infiltrate governments to try to create a little bit more of a power base. And of course, they're in the PR game now. Watch this. Our two unions are fighting for policies that help all kids. The NEA Rhode Island supports things like repairing school buildings, universal pre k yeah, all... ending student hunger, raising awareness about mental health issues, and advocating for social justice. So spare me the nonsense about teacher unions being the problem. Gee, kid, you really know your stuff. Well, my mom's a teacher. Classic. Classic. 
uh, impact on this? No, it seems like a national can ad, but why not? The local union takes it up. Funny stuff. In the meantime, uh, headline on the recents. Now he says nobody ought to testify, including Mueller, as if he actually has a role in this. Roll it. President Trump has reversed course, now insisting special counsel Robert Mueller should not testify before Congress. On Friday, the president said that he'd leave Mueller's testimony up to his attorney general, William Barr, who was asked about it last week by the Senate Judiciary Committee. I've already said publicly, I have no objection to him. But yesterday, the president rejected that stance, tweeting, quote, Bob Mueller should not testify, no redos for the Dems. Earlier in the day, both Democrats and Republicans took to the Sunday morning political shows, saying they're eager to hear from the author of the 448-page investigation. He is the, uh, the fact witness here. He was the one that conducted the hearing, the investigation over two years, spending multi, you know, well over $30 million, had all the assets in place with a grand jury and everything. He's the one that is the central figure here. On Fox News Sunday, House Judiciary member Democrat David Cicilline said that a tentative date of May 15th has been set for Mueller to testify. The White House has so far indicated they would not interfere with Mr. Mueller's attempts to testify. We hope that won't change. Cicilline later clarified on Twitter that, quote, nothing has been agreed to yet and that a date had only been proposed but not yet accepted. And so my political sociologists and that is a field of study and it's been I don't know if it's been perfected or corrupted in the last four years. What, what, which, which is it? Well our political sociological corrupted imagination. Is the wrong word. Perfected or blown apart and having well, to re yeah, restructure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's Corruption's the wrong word. The imagination has been expanded, and the question is, is whether our disciplinary can container can hold it. Because there are all sorts of new questions that we need to be raising. Not least of which, following this headline, is we didn't think that at the upper reaches of American politics, that fear was a central affect, emotion, tool of political governance. And yet, I think we have to think about the way fear is working in this moment. How is it? So this is what I'm trying to figure out. I don't understand. Who's fear? Fear is circulating. So f Trump, as a mode of his governance, incites fear of others. We are afraid of people coming from Central America. We are afraid of Iranians. We're afraid of all of these different, typically non-white people around the world. However, now I'm beginning to wonder whether all that fear mongering is seeping into his own soul. So much so that you could wonder why if the Mueller report, Mueller report exonerated him, why is he now saying Mueller shouldn't appear? Why, when Attorney General Barr was prepared to talk with Congress, why did he withdraw from the congressional hearing? Some people are saying that they're afraid. Why are they afraid? And that's because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that their stories about how the Mueller report exonerated Trump are going to be unwound because that is simply not true. Hmm. You slipped in Iran there. I'm not sure how that has to do with any kind of bias. It's got to do with policy. We have a headline on that, Kev, right, uh, that we were to hold there. Carrier to Persian Gulf. This is brand new. Uh, stepping up. That's policy. That's policy, but it's a policy that's being mobilized around fear. Because... Well, America, you know, carries a big stick. It carries a big stick, but it, its stick is more powerful when it's He's used with others. He's not unique to carrying the big stick no, and using it. absolutely not. Absolutely not. But he is different in the sense that he typically doesn't try to coordinate with allies around the world. And our withdrawal from the Iranian Accords, our maneuvering right now to pressure Iran, it feels like a common strategy actually that he has. It's let me provoke you. Let me have sort of incendiary actions that make you afraid. 
and I'm going to try to make you a, as afraid of po as possible so that you act in a way that confirms why I should have been afraid of you. Pelosi, let me jump to Pelosi in this. He was trying to provoke Pelosi over these last months. Right, you know what, this, this is going to be a good one. Hold on, I want a full Pelosi when we come back. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> Hours after Attorney General William Barr bucked a congressional hearing on the Mueller report. It's done. President Trump told Fox News he doesn't want his aides testifying either. Nobody has ever done what I've done. I've given total transparency. It's never happened before like this. One Democrat mocked Barr's absence yesterday by feasting from a bucket of KFC and placing a plastic chicken in front of his seat. Republicans were not amused. We're not getting that opportunity today because the stunt in the circus continues over here. House Democrats are ready to hold Barr in contempt after the Justice Department missed a subpoena deadline to release the unredacted Mueller report. Just keeping you up to date, I know you have a Pelosi point, but uh, the senator from Tennessee, um, quite the knucklehead. I, the, the, I, the Democrats don't just, they just don't seem to understand that they've got something here, and every time they build some momentum, they do something stupid. Yeah. Now, why the chairman would actually even laugh or enjoy that yeah. is beyond me. It's beyond me. So, my quick take on that, I watch Congressman Cohen on TV quite often. He is the most entertaining and interesting guy I see from that committee. but they sometimes don't know the optics. And that one picture of the chairman overlooking Cohen, you know, laughing, that's terrible. So, so they, know the, how to, they know how to snare defeat from the jaws of victory, don't they? And that circular firing squad, all these things. All that. Yeah. But you were making a point on Pelosi, okay. re all of this, that's what right. is it? So one of the things that enables Trump to win in lots of circumstances is that he makes, he, he makes people uncertain, unstable, provokes them into rash actions like Cohen. Pelosi is too savvy. So what Trump is doing by saying, no, Barr, you shouldn't go. No, we're not going to release the Mueller report. Even though these are not his decisions, Barr is paying attention. So he's doing all he can to move impeachment. Pelosi is saying, we can't do that because if we move toward impeachment, do you think Trump is 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 antagonizing for impeachment? Yes, he's bucking for that fight. But here's the problem: hmm. How do we think of impeachment? Is it simply one political position versus another, which is what Trump would want us to think about, or is impeachment? the mechanism by which constitutional authority can be preserved. And this is the problem. Trump is trying to provoke the Democrats to go all out and to enable him to say, look, they don't respect the office, even while he is the one who is not respecting the division of powers in that our Constitution enshrines. So is that fear? Not in that case, but it's it's akin to that. It's mobilizing sentiment so that we can't have a rational debate. We can only have a fight to the death. In fact, you know I'm a, I'm a martial artist, right? So one of the things that I, I learned, you, I just about, learned you used to be a scratch player too. I'm not golf, scratch. But, I was a college but, golf. Yeah. But I, so I am still a martial artist. I flip the things I do at the appropriate ages. And um, one of the things I think about is that the Democrats still are trying to f play to have this fight, keeping their gloves on, their boxing gloves, playing by Queens of Marsbury rules. Whereas Trump is playing ultimate fighting, no holds barred, and in fact sneaking in weapons that are to, be I, to I destroy that, the game. I think that's, and that's so, the problem. I think that's so on the money. And it's not just Trump and the Democrats in Washington. I'm finding this across the board. I'm finding this locally on, on some issues that we're dealing with here that rules of engagement have been thrown out. That's right. And 
so if no one respects the rules, the playing field that the rules are executed on becomes redefined and perhaps irrelevant. Yeah. You got to give the guy credit. You and I have been talking about him, and you've been teaching about him, and you teach a class on him, uh, which is, I'm, I'm sure is phenomenal. He he has just barnstormed with the protection of the base, has barnstormed the definition of almost everything. Right. He has he has ripped our respect and recognition uh, of institution. And I think the Democrats are making a huge mistake here if they pursue this impeachment thing on that playing field because his playing field is different. Now, you could elect another president down the line who reestablishes the playing field is legitimate, and if they screw up, then you get them on this. But he has broken it. I'd rather hear more of your theory than mine, but he's broken right. it. You, it you. So, so, he, so th this is the problem. The Democrats are trying to use the rules of the game to fight with a guy who, who uses them. their attempt to rule, use those rules to destroy them. So this is why I, I think we need to move toward impeachment. But Oh, uh, we'll break. Because I just said I don't think so, and Mike said yes, and now we got to know why. Stay with us. All right, the professor says we should impeach, or Democrats should, but I have to throw this in before I forget it. Uh, the, the president even decided that he was going to weigh in on this oh-so-controversial derby finish. We have, the, we have the tweet, you know, the country house at 65 to 1, uh, you know, end up being the winner, took down maximum security, or the stewards did, in what was, without a doubt, the absolute right decision. I've been following horse racing for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the leading horse, the seven, veered. And you can't veer. And it's as simple as this. And this guy is talking about political correctness impacting a steward's decision to take down a horse. What is that? Can you, what is the sociology of that? Give me 10 seconds on that. The politics of distraction. Tiger Let Woods me, today. Tiger Woods. I mean, this is, in some ways, you could celebrate a guy who does that great golf comeback to win in the Masters. And maybe... I would hope a moral comeback from where he was in the depths of depravity. But to talk about Tiger Woods in the same breath as all of those people who received the Congressional Medal of Freedom, right, before, is abysmal, especially. Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas are winners, I think. I don't know. I just brought it up, but I think they are. But, es but especially when Trump has commercial relationships right. with Tiger Woods. Well, he's so transactional. That's right. Why yes, impeach? So, I said this. There'll be no conviction. I, I know. I said this, actually, in the very beginning when we were talking about it. I said Trump won't last. I underestimated Trump's ultimate fighting championship abilities. So he may last. But here's the trick. I think Pelosi recognizes that ultimately there will have to be impeachment proceedings. But she cannot say that yet. Even Cohen is backing off from this, even though he introduced articles of impeachment before. They are saying, we're not going to go for impeachment. But by having these hearings, by pulling all of this stuff from Deutsche Bank about his bank records, his income tax, this and this and this, they're setting up this process by which they will have created the evidence before impeachment. You said about for Mueller? The, you said Cohen. You meant, did you mean no, Mueller? No, Cohen, the congressman from Kentucky. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Congressman from Kentucky right, he, introduced right. impeachment before, right. and now Checking he's man. saying, right, I'm yeah. going with Pelosi. I don't want impeachment now. Because impeachment is the battle that Trump wants. But he wants it now. I think Pelosi and the Democrats are right to say, let us not talk impeachment explicitly, but let us get all the data out there so that when we have it all in front of us. The public calls for impeachment, not the Democrats. And that's how Trump will be defeated. Pelosi is hoping that come 2018, or 2020, that Trump will simply be defeated at the polls. And I'm afraid of that. Because what's gonna happen if we don't move toward impeachment 
is that we're going to just say the Democrats have one view, the Republicans have another. No. Trump is corrupt, and there is a constitution to protect. Trump is, Trump is da endangering uh, I, uh, this constitution. Listen, there's data out there that says most Americans believe that Donald Trump made, uh, committed crimes prior to being elected, and that same number say they don't want to see impeachment. That's right, but that's why that's why the Democrats are smart. They want to get the data out there, because if we're basing it on the decisions of one opinion versus another, then it's a political thing. Mueller, but if it's Mueller's testimony, Mueller, Mueller's testimony right. could be dramatic. That's right. Could move the needle, but at the end, you can't have Mueller on television every day. The Senate says no, not guilty. He gets refueled. He's on the comeback trail. The economy remains stable. If it does, knock wood, there's no world crisis. Not yet. I don't I, know about I, these, this. Here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. No? If you had a real power Democratic candidate, would you still be thinking this way? Because right now, that field, if Joe Biden is the best bet, and he probably is, he's a, he's a worn shoe. He's not, he's not somebody that people are going to get behind as a le legitimate adversary in, in November of next year. I don't you know, know what? We have a lot of time before next year. And I want to watch these primaries because if we're relying on our past assumptions about who's a great candidate, I think we're going to miss the opportunity to recognize who's a great candidate. Do you have an instinct as to who might be one? I have a prediction. You want it on the show now? Sure. You know who the ticket's going to be? No. Who? My bet. Kamala Harris on top and Buttigieg as uh, vice president. Pretty good. Pretty, I mean, talk about product differentiation. Yeah. And the two of them are pretty fearless when it comes to him. And they have a combination of smarts and toughs that he just doesn't have. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see. I mean, the, the laying out all the data to an electorate that doesn't want to read it, see it, or understand it, and maybe have a blip of interest in a Mueller uh, testimony moment. I don't know if that carries the day. So I'm not worried about an, uh, 30 his seconds. 40. I'm not worried about his 40 percent. I'm worried about that 20, 30 percent in the middle, and the people who don't think democracy matters, the who votes don't matter. I want to mobilize people to see that an alternative is not only possible but necessary. Stay tuned. Thanks for your visit. My Final pleasure. word, and we come back. I don't know. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm as punch drunk as all of you are when it comes to impeachment versus playing the 2020 election game. Uh, it, isn't, it, isn't it just like on a sunny day in May, something you don't even want to calculate anymore? And so what does that mean? I've joined the crowd of ambivalence out there? No, it just means that it's confusing, it's a conundrum, and it requires more thought. On a spring day, eh. See you tomorrow, another Radio 3 on WPRO. Bye.